610425E. The Forgotten Beatitude. Chicago, Illinois, you see. Thank thee from the depths of our heart for the Lord Jesus, who is our life, and in him we find no fault. But we in ourselves fault when we look into his life and examine ours by his, we pray that you forgive us. We ask tonight that you will meet with us. You promise that wherever two or more would meet together, that you would be in the midst. And if we would ask anything, that it would be granted. And Father, our motive and our objective tonight and our longing in our heart is to see Christ glorified. So we pray that our efforts tonight will be as they continue to bring people to a living faith in a living God, that our God that is not dead, but is alive forevermore. We pray, Father, that you will stir our souls tonight with your presence. Through Jesus Christ, we ask it in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Just a little late and just a little tired. I've been going since Christmas without any let up. So I'm pretty tired. I was glad tonight to see Brother Joseph Bose, who I've been looking to see him for some time, returning from the fields across the sea. And sorry to say tonight that our precious brother and friend here, Brother Tommy Hicks, is leaving us tonight for or tomorrow morning for Canada to have a meeting. I tried to get him to come out and preach for me tonight because I was so tired. Or either have the prayer line he backed up on me so and he said the next time, the next time. And uh, he keeps telling me that. I know that uh, Brother Hicks is, I have the days that I have had with him and the times and the fellowship. I certainly have a great confidence in Tom Hicks of being a servant of the living God, a great masterpiece that I don't believe that there would be anybody could say anything against the reading of the Holy Spirit to Brother Hicks, for he was just uh, one day when he, you heard of his message going to Argentina and didn't even have the money to go, but the Lord sent him and oh, you know, about the meeting and a person that can yield to God like that. You know, God can only use what part of you you yield to him, you see. As I said, I believe one day somewhere, I talked so much in different places and mornings and afternoon meetings and what more. But I said this, that God can use what you yield, like Samson. Samson will not yield his heart to God. He gave that to Delilah, but he gave his strength to God. And God can only use his strength, that's all. But if a fellow could only yield his complete being to God, now that's it. If you can yield your body, God will use your body. If you can yield your mind, your heart, whatever it is, God will use what you give to him to use with. He's seeking to find somebody that he can find yielded like that. God be with you, Brother Tommy. Give you a great, great success. We pray for you in services there. And I'll be in Canada too in a few days. But up in the other end, so give me a great success and safe journey. Brother Tommy Hicks said, God bless you. We thank you. Same to you, Brother Tommy. We had a great time this morning in fellowship around the table of God this morning at the um, where we asked a blessing and had a mysterious breakfast. The first time I've been privileged to meet the mysterious group of the city. And I certainly found some great men, great servants of Christ with great hearts reaching out for God. And I trust that we will sometime and get back where we have a full place all together in a big fellowship meeting and have a great meeting all together here in Chicago. Now, there was a last evening, I think we was praying for the sick and uh, Sunday afternoon I preached on the subject of Abraham and instead after him. Last night I preached on the subject of the greatest news flash that ever struck the world in history. And tonight, if you will turn in the scriptures, if you care to, Matthew the 11th chapter and the 6th verse, I read these words, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. I'm going to call this subject the forgotten beatitude. We are all acquainted with the beatitudes. Over in the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus taught the beatitudes when he taken the people and went up on the mount just before the beginning, or just as his ministry started, he became their leader. And he went up and taught the beatitudes and began. You heard them say, them of all time, but I say unto you, and so forth. Now Jesus was a perfect type of, or Moses was a perfect was a type of Jesus. Jesus was an archetype of Moses. Moses was a prophet. He was a lawgiver. He was a kind of like a king of the people in the wilderness, Israel, and was born a prophet. He was hid from Pharaoh, just as Jesus was hid from the Roman Empire. 
and he his ministry and life just stepped right along and moses when he got the children of israel in the wilderness he went up into the mountain got the commandments came down and began to teach the commandments and jesus when he came into his power he went up on the mountain sat down and began to teach the people blessed are the pure in heart they shall see god blessed are the pure are in spirit there is a kingdom of god blessed are you when you are reviled and persecuted and made fun of and so forth for they persecuted the prophets which was before you rejoice and be exceedingly glad because great is your reward in heaven he was typing moses exactly or moses type was a type of him and we are all acquainted with those types of what Moses was and what Jesus was teaching the Beatitudes. But this Beatitude is on over in the 11th chapter and the 6th verse. And if you don't watch, you'll read right over the top of it and you won't get it. It's wedged in between other words, but it is a Beatitude. And he said, And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me, see? Blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are, blessed are, and way over here he sleeps his gratitude, in again, see, blessed, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Oh, it was a great time in those days. Now, I find that what caused this to start was just after the ministry of this great rugged New Testament, Elijah, John the Baptist, and that's who the message was sent to. And John had been placed in prison because of his ministry, and oh, what a rugged fellow John was and he was really truly the messenger Jesus said that shall go before me and he was an outdoors man and how when they caught him like was perfectly like Elijah who his spirit was anointed he was the anointed Elijah of the New Testament how that Elijah was a kind of a man that didn't like the way Jezebel the more women lived and John the same thing and Elijah lived in the wilderness John the same thing. John was kind of stood by alone just like Elijah did and that great rugged man from the wilderness and then had the, him down in an old mercy wet uh, dump jail. That must have been a horrible experience for a man, John, a man that had been free out in the wilderness, having his meat with the locusts and honey and the wilderness journey out there where he could kill what he eat or take what he wanted out of the wilderness and now he's down in some little old musty dirty jail perhaps dark in a dungeon somewhere because that wife jezebel or herodias had had him thrown in there because he had told him that it wasn't right for him to take herod to take his brother's philip's wife and live with her it wasn't lawful for him to do it and john was one of those men that do not be hold back any punches he just let her fly it made no difference to him and if it was a head off it was a head off that's all just like elijah he was right out forward with what he had to say what was right was right if it was wrong it was wrong god we need more like that today men who will stand on real genuine convictions of the word of god speak it and don't hold your peace speak it out and then we find there that john down in this little old musty dirty jail with some dirty bread they probably throw into him once in a while he had probably gotten thin and no way to read his Bible. And he would got kind of his, um, as one writer wrote about him one time, said his eagle eye got filmed over. You know, the prophets are likened unto eagles and God calls his prophets eagles. It is because an eagle is the most powerful thing of other birds. And the eagle can go higher. So, higher than any other bird and he's got a better eye than any other bird they talk about a hawk having an eye and a hawk being able to fly up in the air however a hawk will try to follow an eagle he'll disintegrate in the air he sure would and now what good is it going to do the eagle to get up there if he hasn't got enough eye to see where back down to the earth again it's just like if what are we doing jumping high if we don't know what we're jumping about seeing and what are we testifying high or making a lot of noise if we haven't got nothing to make a noise about see and it's different now the noise is fine if you got something to make a noise about but wait till that comes first and it will be a noise all your life then but we find that this eagle eye had got filmed over because they had taken him out of his habitation from the wilderness and put him down in an old dirty musty jail and his great man who could be an eagle to soar in this air now 
higher you get further away you can see they get up now in these balloons and things so they can uh, so high in the air that you can take a picture of the entire earth in its curvature and i suppose in this new gadget that russia has got can cross around the world in about an hour and 45 minutes why they can take the entire movie of it turning but higher you get more you can see therefore prophets in the bible were those eagles who could soar way up above the congregation and find out what thus saith the lord was then come back down and bring the news see therefore the word of the lord came to the prophets and john being caged off why it filmed that eagle eye over i felt so sorry one time for a big eagle and i just can't stand to go to the zoo to see them poor things caged up lions and how it's just in prison for life and little sarah and i one time at the cincinnati zoo over here was walking around and mother's getting our dinner ready we was up with the children up there they like to take little boat rides and see the monkeys and what more so we were walking around while mother was fixing the dinner and i heard a noise and i went down at the bottom of the hill to see what it was and they had just caught a big eagle and had put him in a cage and i looked at the poor fellow there and he was bleeding all over his head and his feathers all bit out of his head and all off of the ends of his wings and i watched the big fellow walk across there and then here he'd come trying to take off like an eagle does and he'd hit his head against his bars and knock him backwards and fall on the floor and lay there and roll his big eyes around and look up like that and get back again and here he'd come and hit against the bars again and blood and feathers knocked him out of him and he'd lay on his back roll those big eyes and look up why he was a heavenly bird he was looking to where he ought to be but some cunning devices of man had put him in a cage and I thought that was the most horrible, pitiful sight. I'd have brought that eagle if I'd have had to take up my first offering to have brought that eagle to turn him loose. I thought that poor fellow, I thought, my, if that ain't lawful, that born to be a heaven soaring bird, and here he is by the devices of men, all caged up and is just beating his brains out, but he's caged. I thought this, that's the most horrible sight I've ever seen. Then I turned around to walk away and I thought, yes, that's a horrible sight. But I've seen something more horrible than that. To see men and women who are born to be sons and daughters of God caged in some kind of a cage. When they look up and know there's a God of heaven, know that he's a great healer and a great master and a great savior, and then put in some kind of an ecclesiastical cage where they just beat their brains out with all kinds of societies and everything else and never be able to get out of the cage that's a pitiful condition tell them all about what a great god that was and build them up yonder expectations then knock the whole thing out from under them he died and put in the tomb and that's all of it he's not like he used to be that's a beautiful sight to see people men and women who are born to be children of god and be caged into such things as that john his ego eye truly had filmed over and john was become weary he and elijah was a great deal alike because the same spirit was upon this a different man see john god never takes his spirit he just takes his man god took elijah took elijah's spirit and put it on elisha then he took it off of elisha and put it on john and he promised to put it again just at the end time another one coming at the end time unto elijah another Elijah, which we all as Bible readers know that that's promised to us. Now we find out then that the devil takes his man but never his spirit and he just keeps it coming right on down just the same way and we find out that those two are together and we find that Elijah and John was a great deal alike. They were real nervous men, both of them almost had a nervous breakdown, both of them and the men who live close to God are mostly considered neurotic or something wrong with them. That's right, they always considered that Paul, this morning, when I was speaking to the mystery of group Agrippa, said to him, Ophesta said, too much learning makes you mad or crazy. He said, I'm not mad, I'm not crazy, I'm sober. See, and I'm all right. And too, the claim like William Cowper, I believed it was, when I stood at his grave at London and he wrote that famous song, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from 
Emmanuel's wings, where sinners plunged beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. That man was so inspired till he, after he had tried to take a rope and hang himself, the rope broke. He tried to go to the river to commit suicide, and the cab couldn't find the river. It was so foggy. And just to show that how that inspiration catches a man, catches him away, then when he comes out of that, like Stephen Foster gave his this nation its greatest folk songs, Old Black Doe, Down on the Swanee River, or Kentucky Home, every time that he would get an inspiration and write a song, then he would get on a drunk. Finally, he got under the uh, outermanly inspiration and called a servant and took a reason and committed suicide. And I think about Jonah the prophet, God inspiring that great ego for the air of that day. God inspired him so till he went down there and laid in the belly of a whale for three days and nights, walked out upon the bank and gave a message that made even them people put sackcloth on the animals. And when he, the spirit left him, he went up on top of the hill and sat down and asked God to let him die. That's right. We find this great Elijah who, drawn on the type of the great eagle of that day, mighty rugged man, great woodsman, lived in the woods in a cave, and he came out, stomped out into amongst the people, and God would take him up into places that Israel knew nothing about, and declare the message and say, It last saith the Lord, and stomp back into the wilderness again. To find that great eagle when he stomped out there, and told that king, they'll not even be due come from the heavens, but according to my word, walked right back out there when he walked down that Samaritan road that day, that stick in his hand, that piece of sheepskin wrapped around, that bald head shining whiskers hanging down them steps, just as sturdy as it could be, coming down that Samaritan road. But he knew who he had been in the presence of. He wasn't afraid of what Ahab was to say because he had been in the presence of somebody greater than Ahab, he had been in the presence, and he had thus said the Lord, those old eyes setting back there with those wrinkles, he was looking right towards the sky, he was walking steady, because he, Lord, he had thus said the Lord, oh, he was an eagle, went up on top of the mountain and drank at the brook, there until it went dry, and went back down there and called a meeting when god gave him a vision went up on top of the mountain and said let's prove who's god let's see who is god if he ever was god he's still god that's right oh i like them eagles yes sir went up there and said if he let's prove god and he said or the way that god told him the vision he said you take a bullock and i'll take a bullock and you Call on Balaam and I'll call on God. And ever which one answers by fire, let him be God. And while he was so certain of himself, so certain of his vision, while they were calling on Balaam all morning and cutting themselves and screaming and jumping, he walked around and said, Say, maybe you better holler a little more. Maybe he's uh, pursuing or maybe he's taking a nap. You see, oh, he knew where he was standing. It was that after he had proved God, his ego eye became filmed, and when Jezebel threatened that she should kill him, he ran out into the wilderness. God found his servant laying under a juniper tree, running after he had proved God to be God. Nervous, upset. When you go up in those spheres, it does something to the human heart. When you come down, you can't explain it. It takes you somewhere. There's no need of trying to talk about it, visions and so forth, that tears you to pieces. You can't tell the people. They don't understand it. They never have been there so how would you know about it so it tears them to pieces so god so kind to his servant though to feed him and encourage him and out under the juniper tree but after he had such confidence in jehovah so sure that he could walk up before the king and said not even dew will fall but according to my word stormed right out of the king's palace anointed then he had a vision of what to do. Then he went right out there on that mountain and took and called fire out of the heavens, proving he was God. Then called rain down out of the heavens. 
on the same day and then kill 400 men, priests, pagan priests, cut their heads off and then run when the vision left him, nervous, setting out there, said, I'm no better than the rest of my fathers. I'm no more than any of the other prophets. Now, Lord, take my life. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one that's preaching the great gospel, so just take my life, let me go. They get all frustrated like that. But God said, no, I got 7,000 more that kind never had uh, never brought their need to bail me out, see? But I, that's the right, Elijah, you're doing a great work, but I still got another bunch, you see, that you don't know yet. But take my life, I'm no more than my father's was, prophets before me, let me die. And here, John, a whole lot like him, laying down here in prison, mastering out after he had stood on the banks of the Jordan, come to the wilderness, received the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb three months before he was born, certainly did. How? When he had first heard the name of Jesus Christ, when Mary came up there and she heard, she has not yet, she had never felt nothing. The angel had just overshadowed her. The Holy Spirit had told her she took off to Judea and she was oh, told Elizabeth that she was going to be mother and said, God has overshadowed me and I'm going to have a child and I'll call his name Jesus. And little John was six months already. Elizabeth was in a motherhood pregnancy and she had not yet felt, even felt life. And so while she was standing looking at Mary's face and Mary telling her what the Holy Ghost said was going to happen and had told about the experience that she had, had an old woman had conceived and then how her husband was stricken down and were standing there and she said is going to have a sign called his name jesus and as soon as that precious glorious name of jesus was spoke first in a human leap a little dead baby laying in its womb jumped and received and come to life and received the holy ghost in the mother's womb Sixty one zero four two five E part two paragraph sixty two said whence comes the mother of my Lord for as soon as a salutation come to my ears my baby leaped in the womb for joy and the Bible said he was born from his mother's womb full of the Holy Ghost a man called of God come out into the wilderness at nine years old no education took off into the wilderness and was a woodsman at 30 years old, he came out of the wilderness preaching such a message of a coming Messiah that he shook the regions and he wasn't afraid of the doctrine of the Pharisees, said, you snakes in the grass, don't you come around here saying we have Abraham to our father, you generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Oh my, he was rough. Said, I'm telling you of a Messiah. That's coming with a fan in his hand. Amen. He'll thoroughly purge his floor. He'll take his wheat to the gunner and he'll burn the shaft with a crunch of fire. Whew. He knew what he was talking about. Now, but when this Messiah finally comes, came, when the Messiah finally came, and John had the honor of baptizing him, he came just exactly right all the signs was right he showed the messianic sign and john knew that that he was the messiah that's the messiah there's no doubt about it john said i saw that pillar of fire light coming down upon him in the form of a dove a voice speaking from that pillar of light saying this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased to dwell in he knew that was the messiah john said i didn't know him but he was in the wilderness said for me to go baptize with water said upon whom thou shall see the spirit descending and remaining on he's the one that will baptize with the holy ghost and fire and i'm sure this is him so he blasted it out but when trouble set in jesus came and showed the messiah that he was a messiah with a fan in his hand going up to burn up the shaft but he found out the works of jesus he was meek and lowly so it worried him he didn't know he didn't know what to see he thought now there's something wrong here somewhere seemed he had believed the wrong thing it seemed like it wasn't working right and there's many times that we think too that it isn't working right but it's working right as long as we know that he's here 
what difference does it make? It's working right. Maybe it ain't working according to the way we think it ought to work, but it's working according to the way God wants it to work. You say, well, John, thought, well, now I introduce the Messiah that had his fan in his hand and was going to purge the floors and take his way to the Ghana. And I told them the axe was laid to the root of the tree and he was going to take all the trash and burn it up. And here he is, instead of a great mighty man like that, here he comes, meek and lowly, something we must have went wrong somewhere. He said, there's no doubt, but something is wrong somewhere. He thought it was a right. He became dismayed, like many of us do, when we see things going on that it isn't what we think is just right, we become dismayed. Don't be weary. It'll all be all right. The devil got a hold of him in there. The devil thought, now I've got him in the jail now. I throw him in jail, so I rough him up right good while I got him in there. God isn't using him right now. I got him in jail, so I will put every kind of a blanket over him I can. I got him all caged up. I got the eagle in the cage, so I'll just make him wish he never preach the gospel. That's the way he does a many. And there's a many good man in that same shape today. That's exactly right. We think it ain't working right, but it is working right. Everything's all right. Here the other day, a little, I see so many people come in and say, well, Brother Branham, I was prayed, for I uh, really didn't get any different. Well, there's something wrong. No, there's not. There's nothing wrong with the system. There's nothing wrong with God. There's nothing wrong with the Bible. There's nothing wrong with the Holy Spirit. The thing of it is, it's something wrong with you. Everything was running all right. It was just John, that's all. So there was a lady came down the other day from Zion City. She may be here now about a month ago. That little woman, her little husband, a beautiful little couple, and they came down to my place and they come down with some good friends of mine, Simpsons, from up there at Zion. And they may all be sitting here tonight as far as I know. And she had a little baby. I think it was born with a foot hanging up like this and couldn't get his foot down. And she just said, if I can only see Brother Branham, put his hands on this baby, that foot will drop down. Why? She brought it shoes to wear, home and everything, and said, that's yes, sir. So I was praying up at the tabernacle at uh, or preaching. And when I got through, I was trying make a way to get out to another meeting or over in Bloomington, Illinois. And the first thing you know, when I started to leave the platform, I believe it was going in to take foot washing. We are, we believe in foot washing. I believe that's the Bible teaches that. And we're supposed to do it until he comes. And so we try to keep every word that he said. And we wash, uh, was observing this at our church, which we always have for 30 years now. We were going in for foot washing and my son come up and said, Dad, there's a people come from Zion there, said they was expecting to have prayer for the sick tonight. He said, they got a little baby that the old woman believes if you'd ever pray for that baby, that little leg would drop down. It's got a bad leg. I said, bring it here. And the little beautiful mother, she come up and she said, my baby, Brother Branham, we have believed, husband and I, when you lay your hands on the ba this baby, that leg is going to come straight. It's going to be all right. I said, do you require me to find a vision from the Lord? She said, no, sir. Just lay his hands upon it. I said, all right, I'll do that. Laid my hands upon it, prayed for it, went on in the room. And the next day I was at the office when uh, I was sitting out there and answering some calls and doing some of the work there at the office, a car drove up and the little baby got out, her and her husband, and here they come, said Brother Branham, said something went wrong. I said, oh well, what do you mean? Why? She said, the baby's leg is not down yet. And I said, well, what's 
that I've got to do with it. And she said, well, I believe, Father Abraham, I believe if you ever lay your hands on my baby, that God would heal it. said, I believed it and said, and something went wrong somewhere. She said, maybe you better have a vision for it. I said, no, no, there's nothing wrong. No, not a thing wrong. Only thing is wrong is you, see? I said, you just believe it. She said, one thing, I'll ask Brother Branham, do you think it's God will for me to be crippled? I said, I don't believe it's God's will. She, that's all I wanted you to see. Out of there she went, and a few days ago they called up, and now the baby's leg is back normal, come down. They see we got frustrated, that's all. Everything is running all right. Everything is just according to time. So we find out here that the devil tries to make the people believe or disbelieve. So the devil is trying to get John to disbelieve that he was a Messiah. So he got two of his disciples together and he sent them out and said, Now you go out and find whatever he's preaching. And when you do, you go out and ask him, Have I been wrong? Could you imagine that? Could I have been wrong? Is he really the same one? I know the sign was right. I see the messianic sign. I know that was right. But this meek and lowly and all this, I don't get it. You don't. I can't figure it out. I can't make it. Ends meet with it. You're not supposed to make ends meet. If I could tell you the whole thing and you know it all, and I know it all, it would be no more be faith. Anything that I can perfectly explain is not faith anymore. By faith, are you saved? By faith, are you healed? Just you just believe it. You can't explain it. You just believe it. So he said, you go and ask John. Or ask him if we should look for another. Was my faith, my confidence, and my, I saw that my son sign over him, and I have been wrong. Have I been mixed up? Now has something went wrong? Now, when these disciples came to Jesus with this great prophetic message, Jesus never said to them, now I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send you back some literature to give to John, how to be happy in jail. No, he never said that. He didn't say, I'll give you a book on patience and tell you John how to be patient while he was in jail. It's a good thing. He's in jail and I hate see him in jail, but I'll tell him now how to do it. Oh, just be to be happy. No, he never said that. You know what he said? He said, you stay till this afternoon meeting. Just stay over and then you can leave after that. Just watch this afternoon meeting. And after Jesus had the meeting, I'd imagine those disciples of John sitting there watching every move he made because John had taught them what that Messiah was and told them what it was. And these was his disciples and they begin to see what has taken place. So then after the service was over, then when the two disciples went back to meet John, he said, go tell John the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. And all that comes to the meeting is poor. All the poor people has got the gospel preached to them. And tell John not to be scared, not to think anything different. I'm right on schedule. Everything is running right. Everything is all right. I'm right on schedule. Go tell him there is, is a healing service going on. The poor has got the gospel preached. The power of God is moving among them. I'm right on schedule. Don't pay any attention to nothing else. I'm right on schedule. Oh boy. Oh my. And blessed is he who is not offending me. Now, don't be offended. I believe there's more people offended in Jesus than any other person that ever lived on earth. They get offended too quick. Jesus now, in his misplaced beatitude, slipped over there. So we get it tonight. Why? He said, blessed is he who is not offended in me. Don't be offended in me. No matter what takes place, everything is working right on schedule. So you just go ahead and believe it. That's all. Everything is all right. Just go ahead and believe it. You know, there, Jesus didn't rebuke John for that. He didn't say, well, I'm ashamed of my apostles. I'm ashamed of my prophet. No, he never said that. He didn't say, what's the world going to say about this? When you come preaching, oh, such a great Messiah, and such a great Messiah, and then you send out, ask if I'm the Messiah, he never rebuked him. But when John said the worst thing they could say to Jesus, 
Jesus said the best thing that ever John ever had said about him, yes. Jesus, John said, go if you, he is at one. And after they left, Jesus said to them, he said, after the disciples of John left, said, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? Did you go out to see a man dressed up in fine? No. He was too far from Hollywood for that. So he said, did you go to see a man in fine raiment? said, they have king's palaces. He said, what did you go out to see? I read, there's just uh, any domination could blow any way it wanted to. Oh no, certainly didn't. So what did you go out to see? A prophet said, you went out to see a prophet and greater he is more than a prophet said, this is that Elias, that is too, that one that is said by the prophet, I sent my messenger before my face, said very I say unto you, there's never been a woman born of a man, man born of a woman as great as John the Baptist. He never condemned him. He knew that he was anointed with the spirit of Elijah, and that spirit was on him. That's what he did it. He knew everything was running all right. Everything was running according to schedule. John, why was he a greater than all the prophets? Now, if you're spiritual, you'll catch something. Why was he the greatest? All the other prophets had spoke of the Messiah, but John introduced him. He was the one that presented him. So will it be in the end time? Everything is running according to schedule. Don't be offended. Just believe. Today, the church is offended in him. The church is the people are offended. They are all frustrated. They don't know what to think. Mental telepathy is something else and all. No, don't be offended. Our message last Sunday was trying to show you what God did to Abraham and to his seed after him. And we find out at every junction, he taken Abraham. He took his seed through justification, through sanctification, through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, through the placing of a son. And then God came in human flesh, turned his back to Sarah's tent, and told what she was thinking in her heart. Don't get scared. He's right on schedule. Aha, uh -huh. he's here. Don't be offended in him. Blessed are they who is not offended in me. Was here to speak tonight. He would say the same thing. He's right on schedule. The prophet said there would be a time that would be not day or night, but in the evening time it shall be light. He is right on schedule. He has then come through justification, Luther age, sanctification, Wesley age, Pentecostal age, Dan placed his gifts into the church and now appeared to us in our flesh as Jesus said he would. Don't be offended at him. He's right on time. John, get out of that jail. Get out of that organization that don't believe in it. Pull the fetters back off your eyes. You are a free man if you will believe it. He's right on time. It shall be light in the evening time. Amen. The evening lights are shining. What is he? The same Jesus. The same sun that rises in the east is the same sun that sets in the west. The son of God rose on the eastern people. What did he do to prove to the Samaritans and the Jews that he was a Messiah? By showing a sign to them that he was a prophet that Moses spoke of. The Samaritan woman witnessed the same thing, saying, We know that when Messiah cometh, He'll tell us these things, but who are you? He said, I am he. She ran into the city and said, isn't this the very Messiah? The man told me what was wrong with me, what I'm doing. Isn't that the Messiah? And the people believed it. He did that to the Samaritans and to the Jews, but not to the Gentiles. For the gospel went to the Gentiles. He was already glorified and in glory. But it shall be light in the evening time. What did the church do? Went off into Catholicism, organized a church. Then Luther pulled out of for justification for the seed. Then Wesley came through Luther, sanctification, and then the Pentecostals, and they organized, and on and on and on, their systems, and on down. Now we get to the last days. What is it? But in the evening time, before the boat was changed of Sarah and Abraham to receive the promised son, he came, sat with him, talked with them, and done a sign before them. And Jesus referred to it. We are not behind. Don't look back to what Luther said, what Wesley said. Look what Jesus said. Look at the sign where we are at. Don't look back what somebody else said. Look what he said. He was the one said it. And the same sun that rises in the east sets in the west. There has been a dismal day. It certainly has been enough light to see how to join churches and make organizations and so forth. But that real power and manifestation of the presence of God has not been seen for years and years and years. We felt it. We know
that he is here. We sin. His gifts work with it. But when he see him come visible to us with power in his church to reach up on them on the hem of the garment of the master and touch it, bring back down his power here and speak to his people here and reveal, making him God, God with us. Oh yes, John. God, open the prison doors tonight and let you out. Blessed is he who is not offended in me, not a mind reading or a telepathy, but a power of a risen Christ who is soon coming. Let us pray. Dear God, as the evening lights are shining, it puts the eyes of many out, but others are using it to walk in. I pray, God, that tonight that you will give the evening lights again and to the, this evening people, and may they see the power of your resurrection. For you said yourself that the works that I do show you also, and we wonder what works that you did. Then we find in John, the fifth chapter, and the 19th verse, that you said, I do nothing until I see the Father doing it first. Then you promise that we know it's true. Now, for once more, Lord, and then it will complete. And many, 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 of the Johns are shut up today in prison. Fine men and women that know you as a savior, and they've been wondering, oh God, may they see that you're right on schedule, you're right on time. Grant it, we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, just before we have our altar call, I just a little late tonight, and I thought last night I, I preached. I'm going to tell Billy, I sure made it tonight. He told me I couldn't preach less than an hour and a half. But I sure got it out that time by the help of the Lord. Now, I believe we gave out prayer cards yesterday. Or did he give out any today? Or what was them once? One to a hundred. I believe he gave out yesterday, wasn't it? What was that? Is. Is. All right. Where did we start? We went. We started from one yesterday. Didn't we? One. Let's start from the back then. Let's see. Let's start. Get about just a few up here because our time is. Sh Let's start from 80. How many has ever been in one of the meetings before? Raise your hands. Just look here. Half of the meeting. If Jesus Christ. How many knows that Jesus Christ has already healed the sick, already saved the lost? Now, he couldn't save you or heal you. He would just tell you he has already done it. You have to believe it. But he promised that the works that he did would uh, we do also, and especially in this evening time. How many knows that? Believe that that's the truth. Does it say he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? He certainly is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All right. If he is, then may he act that way. Now, all of you in the prayer line standing there, that's a strange. Uh, strange. <laughs> to me, that you know, that I don't know nothing about you. Raise up your hands. All that know, every one of them, all right, all out there. You people that hasn't got a prayer card and you want to be healed. And you know I know nothing about you. Raise up your hands. All the people, every person in the building that knows that I know nothing about you, raise up your hands everywhere. I don't think as a person I can see that I know. If I'm not mistaken, there's a preacher from Arkansas sitting right here, I believe. These lights you see, I can't see him too well, but I think that's a preacher from Arkansas. How many knows that one time there was a woman come in the prayer line? There was a lady come into, she said in her heart, if I can only touch the border of that man's garment, I'd be made well. She had a blood issue, you remember that? And she slipped through the crowd and she touched a boat like that. Now, you would never felt that. And you know, Brother Tommy, the underneath garment of the Palestinian, the big long robe they wore underneath, garment of kind of the dust, the road picking it up. Now, if she touched the border of that garment, went back out in the audience, and Jesus said, who touched me now? That was the Son of God. 
who touched him. And Peter rebuked him, said, Well, all what be why the people think there's something wrong with you? They are why they're, everybody is touching you, you know. Hello there, how are you, Reverend? and so forth. You know, Rabbi, he said, but I perceive that I got weak. How many know that virtue is strength? Certainly. Strength went out of me. Somebody touched me. And he turned around, kept looking over the audience until he found who it was. At, and he said, told her about the blood issue, had stopped because of her faith, had saved her. Is that the truth? Well, now, is he tonight, he means our brethren, that we eat with this morning. This brother here, I believe, is a brother that he talked about all the degrees he's got in a to school, doctor and PhD. And I don't know what all he was telling us about it, but had forget it all, like Paul, to know Christ. So then, but the scripture teaches us over in Hebrews that he's a high priest now that come be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. That's right. How many knows that to be so? Well then, if he is the same as the student forever, how would he act if you touched him? See, he'd act the same, wouldn't he? A little while and the world sees me no more. It shall see me, for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. The works that I do shall you also. Is that right? And he promised this would come to the Gentile people. Not down through the Lutheran age, Western age, but at the end time, it would happen. Now, don't you see? He's right on time, right on. And remember, this has been done, went around the world, so we're at the end. There's no doubt, no doubt, but you touch his garment. Now, what is it, Brother Branham? It's not me, and it wouldn't do a thing to me if you didn't do it. It's you, just as much into it as I am. It's got to be your faith that does his, touches him, so that he will speak through me. It's a gift to yield myself to him. Just give him my eyes, my mind, my tongue, my being now. I don't know none of you, but it's him speaking through there. See, it's him doing that. So it isn't me. So what caused it to do it? I don't know. You say about me, Brother Branham, I don't know about me. Paragraph 132 of 610425E, The Forgotten Beatitude. I don't know, but he does know. So you touch him. Then he just uses me back. So, see, it's you and I together as his servants. And he makes himself known to his people that he is right on time. He's right with the schedule, just exactly, just before the end time, when the evening lights would shine. Now, if he will not do that, if he will do that, how many will love him and believe him and accept him? God bless you, Heavenly Father. The rest is in your hands. I commit myself and this audience to you. Just one case will prove it, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, let it happen. Amen. Now be real reverend. Don't go get up no more. Sit still. Be real reverend. Just a few moments. Now one word from him will mean more than I could say in 50, 100 lifetimes. Just one word from him. Now you out there now that don't have no prayer card, whatever you are, whatever your condition is, you just say, oh, great high priest, let me touch you. And Brother Branham, don't know me. And then you turn him around to me and let him tell me what I'm praying about. Let him tell me what's wrong with me. He don't know me. Hear oh, something that I'm thinking or doing or whatever it is. Let him tell me. I believe you. Because the Bible said that's just the way he would do. That's the same way he did do. That's the same way he will do. And you see, friends, if one time may Jesus feel weak, what will he do to me as sinner? You will never know until you meet at the gate up there what I, what the price is. But that's, I'm not complaining. I'm thanking God, you see, just so that you'll understand. Well, days will come down and they give out prayer cards. And then along, I pick up those prayer cards along. 
down to the wick or picking out some here and some over here and down here so it won't everybody won't rally for prayer card number one see so they and then the boy before he gets them out he comes down and stands before the audience and mixes these cards up mixes them all up i guess you see him do that all right then he goes down if you want one he give you one then the boy can't see well now i gave a number one he don't know himself he just passes it up see mixes up gives you he might give you 10 and the next one by side of you 95 so then somewhere along through the week i keep i'll call from 20 to 30 or from 50 to 90 or 90 to 20 or somewhere along like that wherever the lord lays upon my heart calls that way why then just wherever the spirit holy spirit leads to call happens to be tonight by that leading this woman a colored woman me a white man i'm a stranger to you we do not know each other one another this is our first time meeting see now now if the holy spirit still remains the holy spirit that was in christ is in us tonight if that's the same spirit then it will do the same work if this is true the holy spirit then it will do the work of the holy spirit if it will do the work of jesus and that way you can be sure then what he was back there you know what he is now so let's take saint john the fourth chapter there was when he being a jew met a samaritan woman and he talked to her a few minutes to catch her spirit and then he told her of where her trouble was and she said sir i perceive you are a prophet we know when the messiah cometh he'll tell us these things and she said to him that and he said i am he that speaks to you and she ran into the city and said come see a man who has told me the things i've done isn't this the very messiah and other people believed and everyone jesus never done it to one pass more person but the whole city believed on him he never healed anybody just went in there declared himself the woman and the bible said that the whole city believed on him because of the testimony of the woman now if that was jesus yesterday and he come come do the same thing as an african girl and an anglo saxon man standing here if he can reveal to me something that you are here for something that you have done or something like that you know you know whether it's a truth or not you certainly would and then if he can tell you what has been certainly he can tell you what will be you believe that to all the colored people here white too and whatever more you believe that with all your heart all right now if any of you people don't believe this is the truth and you believe this is psychology i haven't got no phd you come here and do it yourself i'm waiting for you then if you're afraid to come accept it or keep still about it see i said that because i was led to do it there's something going on that i know about you are aware that something going on here too one of your troubles is nervousness really extremely nervous there it is he guessed it ever you get that all right i could say somebody out there is nervous somebody the lord said something but who is that somebody this is that somebody 610425 e the forgotten beatitude paragraph 153 stand just she has got a nice spirit we see that this is nervous you got trouble with your shoulder too that's right you got heart trouble also is that right you got a burden on your heart is that true it's about a boy uh-huh he's in an institution hospital you're praying for him about him you tell me tell you who you are mrs richardson go believe you will never know what that does to me it just kills the very life now real reverend everyone how do you do sir we are strangers to each other we are but jesus knows us both and has fed us both if god will just let me know what you are standing here for so i wouldn't have to go in too much detail see a whole got a whole line standing there and others out there praying see what it does to me but if he would just tell me something about you you would believe of course one of the things that you are wanting to pray for is your eyes of course uh, you're wearing glasses anyone can see that that's not all that's the matter with the man there's something else because he's got a shadow over him to death his eyes 
couldn't do that. It's the TB, tubercular. You had an operation for it, wasn't successful, hasn't um, done like it should have done. Is that right? You believe now it's going to be all right? Just believe with all your heart. Would you believe that he is a son of God and healed you? Would you stand? Then just walk on by saying, thank you, Lord, that I will get all right. I don't know you. We are strangers to one another. Do you believe Jesus Christ to be the son of God? Do you believe he sent me as a messenger to the church in the last, these last days to produce this scripture and give a gift? Not because it was me, not because he had to get he had he probably would usually does get somebody don't know nothing so he can show himself saying do you believe that these things that i speak of is a truth by scripture she seems to be so full of sorrow is a reason i was talking to her a minute yes it is the first thing is for yourself you've had an operation and that was a, a female lady's trouble a clean out of all the inside of the female organs was removed, but it backfired. It done something. Now, just a moment. It's the dock. It's ruptured. It's ruptured, and you had to return. You had to go back. But you are, that ain't you are, sorrow. Your sorrow is about a child. It's your child. And it's had some disease or something wrong, TB. And uh, now it has some kind of a weak spells like nasrage. You got another one that you bothered about and it's got a ear trouble. That's right. Your name is Mrs. Smith. You go believe the Lord and it will be. Do you believe? Have faith. Just have faith. Believe. How do you do, lady? We are strangers to each other. I don't know you. As far as I know, I've never seen you in my life. And we just meet here for the first time. If I could do something for you and wouldn't do it, then I'd be a, a bad person. I'm not. I oughtn't to be standing behind her the pulpit here as a minister, and I could not help you. And if he was standing here saying himself and wearing these clothes that he gave me, he could only prove that he was Messiah that had did for you. But you'd have to have faith that he did it for you or it wouldn't work anyhow. Isn't that right? But if he would stand here and tell you something, what your trouble is or what you've done, what you ought not have done, or something about it, then you believe half is to believe it, wouldn't you? Would you r that raise your faith of the audience now? You're dealing out on me. Well, you had an accident, bothered in the head, and then you are having trouble in your left side. That's right. Complications. So many things wrong. That is true. Yes, man. If God would tell me who you are, would it help you? Miss Terry, God bless you. Do you all believe with all your heart now? He heals heart trouble, doesn't he? You believe he does? Just go right ahead saying, thank you, dear God. Thank you. Yes, sir. You believe he heals arthritis and makes people well? All right. Just come on. Believe it with all your heart. God bless you. A lady's trouble and heart trouble. You believe he will make you well? All right. Go right on your road rejoicing saying, thank you. You are young to have an anemic condition. But do you believe he transfers blood? Go say thank you, Lord. Go believing. Sign us. And every, oh, you believe he heals it? Just go. Say thank you, Lord Jesus. You will have to have an operation for that tumor. But you believe God will heal you with it, all right? All right. Just go right on your road rejoicing. Think, thank you, Lord. Come leading. You believe he heals nervousness, all right? Go on your road rejoicing. Sing, thank you, Lord. Amen. What if I didn't say nothing to you? Would you believe me anyhow? Come here. In the name of Jesus, may she be healed. Go believing. Come just a moment. Just a moment. Something happened somewhere. Did those people going by there, was in the prayer line, going back there? Oh, yes. That might have been what? Mr. Setting right back here in the row, sitting right here looking at me. You are suffering the posture trouble. Yes, sir. Setting there. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yeah. Have you a prayer card? You don't have a prayer card, do you? You don't need it. Your faith heals you. This second woman from there is your wife. That's right. I see you in a home together and she suffers with trouble with her liver. That's right. If it's right, raise up your hand. Go home. Just Christ makes you well. The lady sitting there next to you has something wrong with her tongue. You believe, lady? If that's true, raise up your hand. All right, go home. You're sitting on the end out there. What about you? There it is over. 
you, you now got bladder trouble that's right Pray ahead, you believe, all right, go home and be well. Do you accept it? What did they touch? Here, here said a man who started crying, sitting right back here, this man. is that young fellow. Now, that man, I never seen him in my life. But listen, son, you got some trouble, that's right, but you was praying. The spirit come upon you, a real wonderful feeling. If I'm a stranger to you, wave your hand like this, I don't know you. Is that what struggle with you? With your hand, all right, you are healed. Jesus Christ makes you well. This lady sitting right back there, suffering with epilepsy. Do you believe that God will heal, you, make you well, heal you? Do you believe it? If you will accept your healing, them spells will leave you. You won't have it anymore. Believe it. The lady sitting there, looking at me on the side, with her hand up like this. Something wrong with you, her uncle. You believe that God will make you well, all right, you can have your healing. This lady standing here with your hand up, you're ready for operation, All that old tumor, but God will take it out, make you well. You believe it, go believe it. This kindly woman with a white band around her head here, colored lady, God will trouble, you believe God will heal you? What about you in the wheelchair? You believe me to be his prophet? You'll die sitting there, you have one chance to live like the leper's world that sat at the gate of Samaria. I cannot heal you, sister. I'm no healer, but those Samaritans, they said, if we sit here, we'll die. If we go in the city, we'll, we'll die. So the only chance we got is to go to the camp of the enemy. If they kill us, we're going to die anyhow. But if they save us, we'll be alive. They had one chance out of millions. You ain't got that kind of a chance. You're invited tonight to the home of a real loving God. Stand up on your feet now. Go walk anyway. Let's raise and believe in Lord Jesus Christ. Raise up if you'll believe him. Stand up on your feet in the name of Jesus Christ and accept your healing. Amen. Take the altar call.